Give me your cross, I bear it. Give me your heart, I'll share it. If that's what it takes, I'm willing to pray for you. said to count the cost to make it even though this heart is aching if that's what it takes I'm willing to break for you so give me your cross I'll bear Within your scars, you show me who you are. No matter the pain and sorrow, wherever you lead, I follow. If that's what it takes, I'm willing to pray. Good morning, church. Y'all look beautiful this morning. Let's, uh, let's all rise to our feet, greet our neighbors, and may the peace of Christ be with you all. Let's just take a moment this morning, just kind of prepare our hearts and just embrace what is surrounding us today. Not only the presence of God, but the presence of our brothers and sisters in Christ. To be able to come together and to lift his name up, to sing promises, to stand on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ together is a blessing. As we sing this morning, just be reminded of the times where you needed to trust God most and he was faithful through it all. And maybe when your hope was dwindling and there's revelation in your life.
words of these songs are just so powerful. Let us be a declaration that we make this morning, Father, that we will stand upon your, your firm foundation. church. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to worship this morning and um, a number of things to share with you this morning. As I'm doing that, feel free to uh, pull out your um, bulletin and um, if you are visiting with us, we love uh, to know our visitors and to get to know them. As a matter of fact, there's going to be an opportunity for that this morning at our uh, first new visitors reception that is hosted by uh, Florence and George Beckett and that's right after church today. So, um, And new visitor can be anybody um, that feels like they want more information or to meet a few people or anything like that. So it doesn't have to be your first time or your first month, um, but please feel free um, to swing by the coffee shop uh, in between our services today and uh, meet with Florence and George, ask some questions, get to know a little bit about our church and who we are, and hopefully how we can help connect you in <clears throat> to the WPC family. Um, and also happening in between services um, today, today is our Ascend student launch, and that's happening this morning and this evening. So first, following worship, there is um, Ascend boot camp, uh, which is happening upstairs um, in our youth lounge. And Dan, I know Dan's here. Where is he? It's just, he's in the back there. So if you are um, an Ascend age student or you have an Ascend age student between anywhere from sixth grade through uh, 12th middle school and high school students you can go with Dan they're going to kind of have their own um, little thing upstairs um, and you can check that out and get to know what that's about at the same time there and that's just a, a short time this morning between services but also tonight is the launch of uh, student ministry again this fall back into Sunday evening 6 to 8 uh, this evening, um, so Ascend Youth Group, um, programming for grades 4 and 5 and also middle school and high school, and um, that's all happening from 6 to 8. So if you fall in that age range or you have children that fall in that age range, you can drop them off here and they will um, be with kids their own age uh, for youth group this evening. Um, also coming up, just don't want to um, let you forget, a week from today, I think, show me what's next so that I say the right thing, Caleb, there you go. All right, a week from tonight, uh, Luminites. Um, and actually, next Sunday morning, Jonathan Pitts will be here. He is going to be preaching at both of our morning services. Really excited for him uh, to share with you. And um, that evening, Illuminates, it's a kind of a roundtable discussion, a Q&A with Jonathan. Uh, Dave Bailey from Ranch Hope will be here. And we'll be having a conversation just like an hour long. And there's going to be a chance for the audience to ask questions at the end, too. 
um, just covering all different ways that faith intersects with life um, through parenting, through marriage, through friendships, just through tackling um, the things that come our way, dealing with loss, all those types of things are going to be part of that conversation. Um, we will have child care for younger, um, you know, smaller children. We'll also have programming for girls and boys um, that are younger as well with the Pitts girls who are going to be here. As a matter of fact, if you have a girl anywhere between the ages of 8 and I don't know, I'd say 14 or so, um, we have magazines on the back table that um, for girls like you, and they're on the cover, you can kind of read and get to know their story a little bit. They'll be here next week. We're really excited about this. And already we are having a lot of uh, seats uh, filling up quickly. So you can register online uh, for this to let us know that you're coming. Make sure that there's space. Um, you know, with John flying into town and his family flying into town, we have a lot of people that we're going to be welcoming here next Sunday night. So please let us know if you plan attending by going and registering online and letting us know how many of you will be here so we can be prepared. I think one more thing for you this morning. Um, we're just, I can't believe we're almost into October. Does anyone else feel like that's nuts? I feel like that's nuts, but we are. Um, and so launching into October, it's a time where we're going to talk about um, putting God first in our lives, putting God first in our hearts and in our giving, um, in our time and all of that. We're going to journey through that together through the month of October. So that is coming up. And one last final thing for you this morning. You might have noticed as you've been coming in the last two weeks or so um, that there's some panels and fall decorations out there. And so what we are doing is creating a, a staged area where people can take photographs just kind of for fun. It can be family photos. It can be friends. I think we have one here today. We did a test run, yeah, with some kids that um, were here this morning. And we just want you to use this space and kind of take some pictures. Um, you can tag us in it on either Instagram or Facebook. And it's just kind of a way of kind of getting our church out there and getting your families out there and just kind of celebrating each other. So just for fun, in case you were wondering what that is, in each season you're going to see it be transformed. So it's in the process of being kind of fallish. Um, it's going to be transformed into winter. Are you following me? And then spring and then summer, stuff like that. So that's what that's all about. We wanted to explain that. We want you to start participating in that if you uh, like taking pictures or make other people stand there. You can take pictures of them either way. That works. But anyway, uh, let's uh, turn to our final song together this morning and, um, and continue on, on in our worship.
Colossians 3, 12 through 17 says this. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love which binds together everything in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. So earlier this week, as I'm dwelling on the scripture, that scripture there, and certain situations happened. We were at a wedding and Kim was there and we're talking about intentionality and that that scripture, can you bring that scripture back up, please? That scripture just has a bunch of intentionality in it to lead with a grateful heart, to teach. It's a lot of action that we're doing. So this morning, with that scripture in mind, we're just, we're just going to sing over our husbands, our wives, our leaders, our family, our church family this morning. And we're going to be very intentional. singing this song during the pre-service, but we're just going to just sing that, sing the chorus. Give me your cross, I'll bear it. You bring the words up, Caleb. Give me your heart, I'll share it. If that's what it takes. as we serve one another, the people you've called us to serve and do fellowship with. We just lift this up in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Hey church, good morning again. How many of you would say that you are living the good life? Anybody? The good life, what you think of, um, maybe some of those images help kind of what you think of when you think of the good life. Um, and Or maybe a, a better word is like a full life. How many of you think you have a full life? And some of you are like, yep, my schedule is full. It is packed and jammed in there, right? Or how about abundant life, right? What does it mean to live that good, that full, um, that abundant life? Um, so there's this preacher, and he, um, this is like way, way back in the day. This preacher, he wrote this book about um, the fullness of Christ, his search for the fullness of Christ, experiencing the fullness of Christ, living into the fullness of Christ. And he t tells in the book um, his struggle for holiness, how many hours he spent just um, praying for purification, for sanctification, for this experience of kind of the fullness of Christ, and how um, he wrestled and struggled with like his sin and his wrongful desires and the things that would pull him away from Christ, and he's writing all about this experience, and he was really struggling. He was wrestling to kind of conform um, his life and his thoughts and his actions and all of that to the way of Christ, and he finally exhausted his pursuit, and he contracted tuberculosis, and he went to spend a year in the sanitarium. Remember, this is a long, long time ago. So he goes and he spends his year there, and um, as he's there, he meets this woman, or he sees, he encounters this woman there who's the same denomination, and um, she has or contracted the same exact disease. And he sees this woman, and he's like, you know, she seems really tranquil, and she just comes off like really pure, like she has got it. And he watched her for weeks, and he became convinced that she had indeed um, discovered or um, found the secret that had eluded him for all of this time. And so one night as he's like struggling in his prayer and he's wrestling with it, he felt like he couldn't wait any longer. And he just, you know, he gets up from prayer and he's going to find her. And before he could get his stuff and get out of the door, there's a knock on the door. And when he opens the door, here this woman stood. And his, her face was like, you know, contorted and she was crying and she was sobbing and she grasped and she said brother harry i have watched you all of these weeks as you've been here and if anyone has found the secret to holiness it is you right maybe you can identify with harry you can identify with this kind of journey or this struggle or this big question, right? And this is ultimately what a story like this gets at, this big question that all of humanity is searching for, right? Not only the purpose of life, but what does it mean to have a good life, to have a meaningful life? And even more so as believers, what does it mean to have that full life in Christ? That amazing kind of spirit-filled life that we are kind of pointing to as we are in this series, uh, Running on Empty. Are we or my, can we, there you go, as we are running on empty, and um, we're talking about this, what does it mean? Not just the good life, like the things that are out there good, but what does it mean to have this fullness of Christ, right? Last week, we talked about one of the stories in John's gospel, Jesus and, and the I am, and there's another story in, in chapter 10 that points us. We're not going to go through the story. You might be familiar with it, um, where Jesus says, not only I am the gate, but I am the good shepherd. And there's a line in this story that many of you know, where Jesus talks about the very thing that I'm addressing here. In verse 10, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I think we have that verse. Can we put, yeah. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But say it with me. I came that they may have life and have it. Say that last word. I, st I didn't hear you. Abundantly. Oh, abundantly, right. Like, have life to the fullest. Some, some translations will translate it that way. Have life to the fullest. So I have a question. What does that look like? You know, what, how do we get this abundant life? And what does it look like to have abundant life? To encounter, to know, and to live out the fullness of Christ. How do we get it? We live out this abundance, right? And we're talking not only about keeping our tank on full as opposed to empty, but having excess, excess, excess that runs when 
we're starting to run on empty. Do you know what I'm saying? Abundant. Abundant means like when I get this image of abundant, it's like gushing out. It's like overflowing, right? It's like the tank is not just on full. It's like beyond that. And that's the image that we kind of get, right? But remember, the one who says this also points out that there's kind of two components here. There's one who offers abundant life, and his name is Jesus. But Jesus says there's another one that comes to do what? To steal, to kill, to destroy. You know, and yes, when our tank is on empty, when we are, you know, not living in that abundant life, and when we can get drained, when we can get overwhelmed, when we hit crisis, when we deal with broken relationships, all of these things, we can say, okay, yes, I get it. He kills, he destroys. But sometimes, too, the way the enemy comes at us is just to keep us right where we are. Do you know what I mean? Like, comfortable. It's like, you got the good life. Your career's going great. You're good. You're full, right? And you're like, yeah, I'm full. I don't have to worry about it. Like, or maybe it's that bank account, right? Like, everything's good financially. Like, I don't have to worry about it. I've got the abundant life. And so I just want to point that out, that when we talk about abundant life, when we talk about the one who comes to steal and kill and destroy, it's not always that we're under attack, right? It's not always like he's coming at me, he's coming at my relationships, and he's, and he's coming at me. Sometimes it's as simple as we can just become content or comfortable with what we would determine as an abundant life that really has nothing to do with Jesus. So what I want to do is talk about this abundant life through the Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossians, to their church. And Dan read for us um, verses 12 through 17. You've probably heard this read. It's a really popular text at a lot of weddings. Couples will often choose this. I've based many uh, wedding sermons around or messages around this text. And I want to jump back to the first 11 verses. And I want to take those 11 verses with you today and just break them into two parts. We're going to look at it. And overall, in those two parts, I want to give you four ways that abundant life comes that Paul suggests to us in this text today. All right, so let's start by opening up to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start right with verse 1. You already see it behind me here. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So, Paul is really clear here. What does he tell us right from the beginning? He says, seek the things above. Seek the things above. Seek, this word in Greek, I think it's pronounced roughly zetite, zetite, means to seek or to strive earnestly, right? It's like this intentional way of seeking, of striving for something. It's an effort. It's not something like, okay, it's, you know, I'm just going to look. No, it's an effort. It's an intentional effort to earnestly strive for something, right? So Paul's saying what you need to do is to seek, to center your lives on the ascended Jesus. Seek the things above, but also set your mind on the things above right? You've heard it before. Jesus says this too and refers to this as Paul puts it, set your mind on things above. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. Do you remember when Jesus says that? Anybody? Like Paul's not just pulling this out of nowhere. He's actually pulling this out of a teaching of Jesus. And ultimately what he's saying is keep your focus on eternity. And then the things of this world actually kind of blur out. Now, you might go, wait, wait, wait. I don't mean that it doesn't matter. I don't mean that our relationships and our families and our careers and our lives here don't matter. But what Paul is reminding the church, and what I think we need to be reminded of often, is to seek and set on eternity so that we're always seeing through that lens and we always have that in our sight, right? To keep it in our focus. To set our eyes on the things that are not necessarily seen. Because let's face it, it's really easy to seek things of this world. It's really easy to set our minds on things of this world, right? The difficult part is to set your mind on the things above, right? And Paul talks about this in his second letter to Corinthians when he's talking about the seen on the unseen. And here, that's exactly what he's saying. Don't forget about the things you can't see. Don't forget about the work that God's doing behind the scenes. Don't forget about the eternal promise and view things through this lens. I love what one commentary says about this, and I'll put it behind me because you need to read this as I read it. 
Believers' lives should be dominated by the pattern of heaven, bringing heavenly direction to their earthly duties. Right? Let that sink in for a minute, right? Bringing heavenly direction to what we do here on earth. So Paul is not saying, keep your eyes on eternity and forget about this world. What he's actually saying to the church is that in order to have the full life that Jesus promises you, in order to have that abundance, you have to remember to keep your eyes focused on the bigger picture, on the eternal picture, right? I love another verse that says, yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with distractions of the natural realm. The reminder to do this, to seek and to set, to strive and to concentrate, to seek and to set our eyes on the eternal picture. And so the first thing that I wanna, the first point that I wanna make this morning with you is that abundant life comes when we seek the kingdom and set our eyes on eternity. When we live in this life like we really believe in the eternal life and when the eternal life when the promise of christ the wholeness the completeness the image of god in us when all of this reality it actually impacts our life here because i think we're so tempted sometimes as believers to kind of um separate those out do you know what i mean and to compartmentalize like well here is eternity and here is earth and those things don't really touch one another but what Paul reminds us is that it actually, really, where we set our mind, where we fix our eyes, where we put our focus really does matter greatly. So that's my first reminder to you this morning. Think about it. Where's your focus? You know, where, where do you seek and where do you set? Where do you see? What is your mind set on? And what do you concentrate, do you strive towards? Right? Paul says, seek the kingdom of God and set your eyes on eternity. So here, let me put it this way, because that sounds kind of heady, right? And it's like, well, how do you do that? What does that mean? Okay, I get that concept. It's not a hard concept to articulate or to take in, but what does it look like, right? And so think about it like this. Nothing that we do in this world should be disconnected from our view of the next, right? And I always think about it like this, and this is a practice I started a couple years ago, it might be helpful for you, like kind of that question of like, when, and I, this is not meant to be like a literal, this is more of kind of like um, an imaginary kind of practice or whatever. But if I'm before God and I have to answer the questions of what I have my heart and my mind set on, of what I'm seeking out, of what I'm prioritizing in my life, we touched on a little bit last year, and just kind of imagining that, like I'm before God and God would say like, okay, you know, I'm going to tell, talk to God about where I'm spending my time or where I'm spending my energy or where I'm focused or where I'm concentrated, um, what I'm doing with my time, right? So, like, if this morning I chose not to come to church, I mean, I know, I'm, I, know I don't really have that choice, but you know what I'm saying. Like, if I chose not to come to church because I just needed that extra sleep or because one of my kids had a game or because of something else, like, I have to step back and go, well, like, what is the eternal connection there? with prioritizing my time. And like, if I'm standing before God and God's going, well, you didn't worship me on Sunday mornings. And I'm going, but you know what? I had like soccer and lacrosse and I was tired and I was this. And I just wonder how many times our answer to that question has eternal ramifications that we're not thinking of now. That has a connection that we're not thinking of or an internal, eternal impact that we're not thinking of. And that if we were to think about the in eternal impact of the things that we do, of the way we spend our time, of the way we prioritize, of where we are set and what lens we're looking through, instead of kind of disconnecting those things. Here, I'll give you a really kind of concrete example about this, right? Seek the kingdom of God and set your eyes on eternity. What kind of eternal impact are you having? And to me, one clear example of this would be Christian athletes. I'm going to just give that as an example, and this you could apply to multiple different things, but I think about it. So um, let's think of someone like, for example, Carson Wentz. Hey, we actually have a picture of Carson Wentz. Did you guys know that Allegra has met him this weekend? Now listen, this is Blue Plate. I ate lunch there twice this week, and I didn't meet Carson Wentz. Like, that's amazing. They were there. Where, where are they? I know they're here. Joe, Joe and, well, half of them is here, right? But you were celebrating your anniversary, right? What? 21 years. Congratulations. 
That's awesome. Right? But he's a great example. I mean, local athlete, right? Obviously, he's known. And here, here's my point, though, the eternal impact. Do you think when he stands before God, God's going to care about his Super Bowl ring? Do you think that he's going to care about Carson Wentz's stats, what his record was? No, but he might care about his, what's his foundation? Uh, audience of one, right? He might care about the people he reaches through audience of one. He might care about those Saturday night baptisms and services that happen on the Eagles. He might care about the stories of people coming to Christ through Carson Wentz, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Another example, Tim Tebow, right? Everybody know Tim Tebow? He played football, right? Did he try to play baseball or did I make that up? He's, he's playing baseball? I'm not trying, I was, I really am asking. I'm not trying to put anybody down, right? Like, so my, that's my point though. Like, yeah, that's awesome. He's a great, I've, I've heard him speak before and he's got this foundation that does this ministry called Night to Shine. Anybody ever seen Tim Tebow work with local churches? He does a Night to Shine. It's this beautiful kind of like prom wedding type event um, that churches host for um, students and kids with special needs. It's beautiful. Do you think God cares whether he was successful in football or not? No, but he cares about the impact he's having on kids with special needs. You know what I'm saying? I got one more example for him. I'll leave football for a second. Anybody know Albert Pujols, right? He played for Cardinals, right? I know, because one of my best friends in seminary was obsessed with Albert Pujols. Loved him, loved him, loved him. Do you think God cares about his statistics? He was an awesome baseball player, right? It was like, hit. was he really good at hitting? Yeah, yeah, yeah that was it, right? I don't, I don't follow baseball, I'm just saying. But I'm saying, I remember he was like, he had these amazing stats, right? But is that what's going to impress God? Or is what's going to impress God what he's done with kids for Down syndrome and how he is using um, his name and his success to improve things in the Dominican, you know he's Dominican, right? Dominican, right? In the Dominican Republic, right? And I just give those as kind of some examples because, like, I've seen especially football, professional football athletes who will claim to be Christians, and I don't know that their lives necessarily reflect that. And then you see guys like Carson or like Tim, and there's so many other guys like them who then they do. Like, they're playing on Sunday. They're not in worship. But guess, what, guess where they are Saturday night in worship? Do you know what I mean? So there's, like, this eternal impact that they're focused on with their lives because their eyes are set on the kingdom of God and how that kingdom is um, meeting this world and how it is working in this world. So abundant life comes when we seek the kingdom and when we set our eyes on eternity and when that matters to us here. But if you keep reading, Paul helps us understand what does this mean. Because like I said, this is a kind of a big concept, right? And it's not something that's necessarily easy for us to understand. So how do we seek and how do we set? And Paul goes on to tell us this, picking up on verse 5. Let me read the second part. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And so Paul starts these with this really kind of poignant thing that he says. He says, put to death, right? Another translation says, eliminate them from your lives. And he's drawing on this imagery that we're familiar with, life and death. Right? Dying to the old and living in to the new. And Paul's reminding us through this, like, you have to live like you're actually alive. You have to live like you actually have died to sin. Like sin doesn't reign in your life, right? Like you've actually put it to death. Like you've actually eliminated it from your lives. And not that you have eliminated it, but that Christ has eliminated. He says put it to death. As a matter of fact, he says put them all away. Put them all away. Them. All of your earthly desires, all of your old self, right? Your quick temper, or maybe it's your foul mouth, or maybe it's that constant desire to gossip, or maybe it's the negative talk, or maybe it's sexual sin or pornography, or maybe it's something else, or anything that focuses on instant gratification and only has a place here on earth. He says, put them all away. And in doing that, put on your new self. 
put on the new self, Paul says. Live as one who has died, who has died to sin. And ultimately what Paul's reminding us is that we can't put on the new without putting off the old. Do you know what I'm saying? How, anybody, I mean, but we try to, don't we? Do you know what I mean? Like we try to. We try to say like, yeah, I've got the new one, but I just, I'm like kind of comfortable with this one, right? And now this is probably, I'm sorry, men in the room, you probably can't identify with this. Maybe you can, but women, like in a dressing room, have you ever been in a rush and you try to try on clothes and you don't take off your other clothes? You know what I'm saying? You're like, <laughs> it'll fit, right? Or I got, I got a dress on, I'll put these jeans on. And then you get home and you're like, these jeans don't look like I thought they did while I'm not wearing a dress over them right now, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? But like how many of you like any, right? And maybe men, you've been with your wife, maybe some men out there, I don't want to be sexist in this, maybe you do, or maybe you've been with your wives, or how many of you like go to the gym? Have you ever thought about putting clean clothes on over your sweaty gym clothes? No, I'm trying to give this like really simple example. And I think this is us spiritually sometimes. We're like, well, you know, I don't like, I know I need to change this, but I'll work on that later, right? And sometimes this looks like we put on the new kind of publicly or in certain circles or with certain people, and we're not always like that privately. Maybe that's part of it. We try to throw on the new without really putting off the old. But Paul says, put to death, put away, put off, and then put on. And I love that he says it three times in three different ways, right? He knows that it's a process. He knows it's like we don't just snap our fingers, right? That the only way to put on the new self is to put off the old. That it takes intentionality. That it takes living into the promises of God. Like believing when, when Paul says, like, you, my brother and sister, can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Not you can do all things, but you can do them all through Christ, right? The support of other believers, that intentional change. Paul's getting at this process, right? And he's reminding us that abundant life comes when we choose our new self. Abundant life comes when we choose our new self. When we put off the old and we put on the new, right? But how? Right? How do we do that? Because does it just happen like that? One of the verses towards the end, verse 10, he says, put on the new self, which we just talked about, and then wait, we have to read the second part. It says, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So you seek and set on the eternal promises of God and on the hope of those eternal promises, right? You seek and you set there. And then you put off the old and you put on the new, and it's a process for us and a process that Paul calls renewal, right? He says, how do you do this? You put off the old, you put on the new, and you enter into this process of renewal where you're being renewed in Christ, where you're being renewed into the very image of your creator, right? This concept of renewal, the goal ultimately, like that is it. Now, let me be clear. When we talk about seeking and setting on eternity, we're not just talking about our time and our decisions and what we do with our life, but we're talking about the way we see ourselves too, right? Because if you're like me, sometimes you can get discouraged in that whole putting off the old and putting on the new, right? You can get stuck in something that, you know, you're trying to hand over to God or you're trying to work out or a change you're trying to make, right? And you lose, you take your eyes off of that eternal because you don't see yourself the way Christ sees you. You don't see that image of God that's being crafted and being worked out in you in this process of renewal, that is not complete until the resurrection, that is not complete until eternity. Do you know what I'm saying? So as much as we can get frustrated with not being able to make the commitments we want to make or not being able to, to make our life what we want it to make or not being able to fix the things we want to fix, we can also get frustrated with ourself. And I think Paul encourages us here, doesn't he? Because he's like, wait, yes, you have to put off the old. Yes, you have to put on the new, but it's not going to happen overnight. It is a process of renewal and abundant life comes through renewal in Christ. Abundant life doesn't come out of my own will or strength. It comes in the process of Christ renewing me. I have a desire to be renewed, but I also have to be patient in that process, right? And can I just say, this is so true, right? Can I just say this? Don't we need one another for that? Do you think we need one another for this process of renewal, or do you think we're meant to do it on our own? Because here's the thing, and Paul says it right at the end, right? Think about renewal, right? What other things do you renew? 
wedding vows, right? Those are a big thing that are renewed. Do you know what else I renew every year? The registration on my car. Do you do that? You, you were looking for something spiritual. But no, I'm serious. Like, if I don't renew, and I forget, like, if you don't renew the registration on your car, it runs out, right? And do you have to, does it just magically renew itself? That would be so nice. So you can do it online, right? And if you miss that online deadline, then what do you have to do? You have to go wait in line at the DMV, you know what I'm saying? It's not that bad anymore, but. But I have to do something, and I have to renew it. So it's renewal in Christ that gives that abundant life. But here's the thing, as we're wrapping up, Paul wraps up here, he says, verse 11, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but, say it with me, Christ is all and in all. Right? So abundant life not only comes through all the things that I've listed, but it comes when we strive and concentrate together. It comes when we encourage and hold each other accountable. It comes when we walk that road with one another, when together we set our sights on the same thing and we seek the same thing. Abundant life comes in Christian community as well. It comes in that sisterhood and that brotherhood and that expression of, I have your back, I'm walking this with you. Wait a minute, you haven't been to church in a while, what's going on, right? What's keeping you away? Or wait a minute, I saw like you got into this argument with somebody, what's going on there, right? Because ultimately what Paul says, and go through this, this list, right? Abundant life comes when we seek the kingdom and we set our eyes on it. Abundant life comes when we choose our new self. It comes when we're renewed in Christ in this process of renewal and it comes in Christian community. And then the text that we started with and began with, because here's what happened, is when this abundant life is happening or experiencing this fullness of Christ, there's evidence of that in our lives. Do you know what I mean? There's evidence. That's what Paul says. He says, when you do these things, this is what it will look like. Right? I don't have a lot of time left this morning, um, but I want to show you some evidence in my life. You see this book? Anybody remember this book? I'm just curious if there's anybody here who remembers this book. You will in a minute. So let me tell you a little story about this, this book. Um, how many of you were here Sunday night? For the installation service. We had an awesome time, didn't we? It was a beautiful, beautiful evening. A ton of great messages, great music, great fellowship. It was amazing. Um, so when I came in Monday morning, there was like a couple gifts that I had left in my office intentionally Sunday night because I wanted to open them because I knew they were connected with my installation and I wanted to open them without my children around who would open them and maybe break them or destroy them. So I left them. So I came in Monday morning, and um, Elaine, if you know Elaine in our office, she, um, the glue that holds our church together, by the way, uh, but she was like, did you open your presents? I'm like, no. She's like, sit down and open. I'm like, I got meetings. I'll do it later. It wasn't until, I don't know if it was Tuesday or Wednesday by the time I finally sat down because I'm like, why do you care about me opening these gifts so much? Well, I'm such a jerk. It's because one of them was from my staff, which incorporates her, and the other was from my session, and it was really sweet. Um, like a new nameplate for my door that, you know, instead of the associate pastor, it's the pastor. And then, like, letterhead and card, note cards with my name as pastor. Very, very sweet. Thank you, elders and staff, for that. And as I was doing that and opening the cards, I was like, wait a minute. I want to go back and find something. Because when I was ordained and installed here um, eight years ago, I remember they gave me a bunch of gifts. You know what? That's what this is. And I went, and you can see what I've done is all in the back here are cards from this time. But, and so many of you are in here, you don't even remember these notes that you wrote me, but there's like all of these handwritten notes and cards from all of you when I was ordained from kids, um, from adults, when people put pictures in, I love it, this is awesome, um, from when I was installed and ordained as an associate pastor. And I was just thinking about that, and I just put that like center in my office just to have some time this week to read through them and to just, you know, have that gratitude of like the church family that God's given us and what God's done and his faithfulness and just as evidence. Do you know what I mean? Evidence of like what God is doing. To me, that's the greatest kind of evidence, that relationship and to just be able to go, wow, these are the people that God has given me to walk with. And so many of you who were here, how I don't know what year we're in and what year I was ordained, but somewhere around that eight or nine years ago are still here today. And that's awesome. So I want to go back to that first question. You know, is your life full? 
do you have that abundant life that not only Jesus says, here, I offer it to you, but Paul helps us understand today kind of what that looks like. And I just want to close with you this morning by going back to the scripture we started with, which is actually after the scripture I preached on, right? I have to make it challenging for you to follow me, apparently, this morning. And I just want you to hear this as evidence. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Is it evident in my life? And then I want us to say, is it evident in our life at our church? Because Paul says, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, be compassionate, have compassionate hearts, show kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other. And a few verses later he says, and put on love, which binds it all together in perfect harmony. And be thankful and grateful for the things you have, but most importantly, do it all for the Lord. And he paints this picture of what it looks like for you and I, friends, to have this fullness of life. Do you know what I mean? This abundant life in Christ. Let's pray together. God, you do offer us this full life, this life in you, this abundant life where we are constantly able to access your grace and your strength. We're able to discover our purpose, where we're able to be reminded that we're on this journey with you. And God, there are times in our life where it's um, so hard for us to, to see you, where it's so hard for us to experience you. There are times in our life where it's so much more challenging to just put that old off and put that new on. And I thank you, God, for your grace in reminding us this morning that her renewal in you is a process. And I'm praying this morning that you would awaken hearts to that, that you would help us to, to set our eyes, to fix our minds on eternity and through that lens to see one another, to see ourselves, to see the hope and the promise. Because God, it looks so different for each one of us. And Lord, those of us that are here today that are just feeling like something's missing, like suddenly, or maybe it's something we struggled with for a long time, God, that something's just missing, that we just don't have that fullness. I just pray, Lord, that your spirit would move in our hearts and minds and just encourage us this morning. Just call us into um, repentance or gratitude, thanksgiving, wherever it is, Lord, that you want us to move this morning, that we might be able to experience that promise of abundance, of fullness that you offer us. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen, amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward this morning as we take the offering. And as we're taking the offering, just have a heart of gratitude blessing
Christ my Savior, you rescued me. Sing it out. Thank you, Jesus. You set me comes from um, the last couple verses of chapter 3 that Dan read earlier just in another version this morning and let this be our closing and our blessing today let your heart be always guided by the peace of Jesus who called you to peace as part of his one body and always be thankful let the word of Christ live in you richly flooding you with all wisdom Apply the scriptures as you teach and instruct one another with the psalms and with festive praises and with prophetic songs given to you spontaneously by the Spirit. So sing to God with all your hearts and let every activity of your lives and every word that comes from your lips be drenched with the beauty of our Lord Jesus. And bring your constant praise to God the Father because of what Christ has done for you.